Thank you. Praise the Lord. A very, very uh, lovely Sunday blessings to each one of you as you partake of our online services. Amen. And um, thank you for all the sharing that I've heard in the worship and everything. I uh, enjoy everything uh, as we rejoice in the Lord. In, in terms of uh, all that God has done, uh, we have been teaching on uh, the parables of Jesus on Sunday and teachings of Jesus on a Friday. So today, last week we talked about parables with joy inside. Today we can talk about the parables with fish inside. And um, Jesus used fish in a particular way. And of course we will also cover uh, any incidences in which fish is involved in his ministry and see how Jesus... Um, express that. So let's uh, look at the Bible and um, today is the parables of fish and it should be interesting. There's one of the drag net in chapter 13 of Matthew. But let's go in order of their occurrence the, starting from the Gospel of uh, Matthew. And one of the first things that um, Jesus did when he went around uh, and called his disciples uh, one by one. When he came across uh, Simon, Andrew, and of course uh, James and John were their partners in the fishing industry. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 18, it tells us that uh, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his to the sea, for they were fishermen. And then he said to them, Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And um, for us, it looks like uh, uh, they, just, they just heard about Jesus and they just uh, progressed accordingly. But there's a background to that. And here Jesus used uh, winning souls in the, in the illustration as being a fisherman. And of course, when you look at fishing, you can do one by one, or you can use a net. And the same way, when we win souls, we can do one by one, or we can do a special meeting like evangelistic, miracle service, uh, and gather a group of people and present them the gospel, it will be like using a net to bring all the people in together and uh, bring them to salvation. So that's uh, uh, interesting that uh, winning souls and fishing for man is the illustration that Jesus enjoyed using because uh, more or less um, that is uh, something which um, is true even when we learn how to bring people to Christ. Now when you think about the allegory of fishing, when we go out to win souls, we need to be aware that a fisherman or a person who go fishing, they need to know where to spot the fish. And they will go to particular places where they know the fish will gather together and where there's opportunity to bring the fish one by one or the cast and end. When we pray about bringing souls to the Lord Jesus Christ, we must of course be in a presence where the fish are, where they gather. And also there had to be a certain opening for the fish, perhaps the fish could be hungry or whatever, that they would take your bait or there would be a certain position. Nowadays they got the GPS to measure where the shoals of fish are flowing around to cast their net in. All these are skills in which a fisherman would develop when they want to have a good harvest. Similarly, sometimes some people are good at winning souls, some others are not so good because they do not know what to do. And it's just not just going out to the street and stand in the street corner and preaching the gospel. It's not just that, you need to be skillful. Smith Vigor's word was one of those that I appreciated, that in his days as a preacher, 
He used to try to win one soul a day and try to go to a certain place to preach or win somebody to the Lord. And I appreciate that you know, he, he has such intensity, such passion, that he'll go out to win souls. But as all of you know, in this end time, more and more people have become hardened to the gospel. Some of them have seen Christianity, they have witnessed preaching, and they are a bit more hardened to the message of the gospel. And we are in a different situation from when the apostles first went out to preach. Everything was brand new. And uh, we're in a situation where people have been, quote unquote, can use such a word, over evangelized, and they harden their hearts. And even in the movies, you see them portraying Christianity in a bad light. And in the movie, they even seem to know what it was involved in salvation. And uh, <clears throat> and they use that theme uh, in a bad light in the presentation of Christianity. But praise the Lord, whatever it is, every time you pray about winning someone to the Lord, you got to think in terms of a fisherman. Your skill and all the things that involve with fishing would be true when you go to win souls. And he that wins win souls, is a bright star in the kingdom of God. So there is a fishing illustration that is there. Let's continue on in this uh, interesting illustration. Now there's one that's quite interesting. And uh, Jesus just illustrate that uh, the Father is so good that if you ask for fish, He will not give you a stone. And that talks about how uh, the Father is a good Father. Our Father God cares for us, loves us, and let, un, un, let, uh, unlike uh, any other human. And when you ask for a fish, He will of course give you a fish. He will not give you a stone. <coughs> as in Matthew 7. Now, Mat Matthew twelve forty is an interesting one. Talk about the prophet Jonah. He says, uh, when they ask for a sign, that's the Pharisees, and we want to see a sign, said the Pharisees. And Jesus said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Of course, Jesus did show many miracles, signs and wonders, which are signs. Uh, but Jesus particularly answered them and said, your only sign that I will give to you is the sign of Jonah. The sign of Jonah was his crucifixion and resurrection. So it says here in verse 40, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The man of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will arise up in judgment with the generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth and hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here, referring to himself, of course. So even at Jesus' time, the Jews have been hardened. They are not like uh, the people in Nineveh who has never heard a salvation repentance message. And uh, the same uh, with the queen of the south who came and visited Solomon because of the fame of Solomon and all that she heard. But Jesus then, the, the Jews were very hardened against him. <coughs> and he said, only the sign of Jonah where <coughs> as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. And incidentally, in case you're thinking about this area, the fish was not a whale. <laughs> it was not a whale. Anyway, a whale is not a fish, it's a mammal. Uh, the fish that actually swallowed Jonah was a real fish. It uh, is huge. And it's interesting that he did not get... Uh, uh, ten to pieces by the teeth of the fish. So God and the angel must be involved. And uh, it seems to be uh, a fish. 
and uh, I I try to look at pictures to see what ancient giant fish could look like. I, I still cannot find any that is um, uh, equal to what the Lord has shown. But definitely, it was not a whale. It's definitely a fish, a huge giant fish. And Jonah was swallowed by the fish and vomited out. And Jesus said, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the center or heart of the earth. And the, of course, uh, when people are looking at the uh, crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, some people um, <coughs> uh, thought that, you know, if he were crucified on a Friday, and there's a Friday night, Saturday night, and there were only two nights, because Sunday early morning he arose. On the first day, uh, in, uh, on, the, on the Sunday, on the first day after the Sabbath. So they were not three nights. And I, uh, in terms of the Bible, I tend to be a bit like Phoenix Day, who is a literalist on some areas, but not too literal until he ignored the omnipresence of God and the omniscience of God. But uh, <clears throat> the Bible has to be, as far as possible, taken literally. And so I've been looking at the three days and three nights of Jesus. And of course, if you count it from the Thursday night, because in the Jewish uh, culture, they start the day of the next day from the evening 6 p.m. of the day before. So the Sabbath will be measured from 6 p.m. the day before to the actual day of the Sabbath and ends on the evening of the Sabbath day. Let's say it begins at 6 p.m. Friday, it will end at 6 p.m. on Saturday. And so we know that Jesus was crucified on Friday, so the Passover that is on a Friday has to actually begin on the Thursday, 6 p.m. So, so you have to include Jesus at Gethsemane when he drank the cup of suffering for us, when he drank redemption for us. That was the beginning of him taking death for us from the Passover, from Gethsemane, there's a Thursday night, Friday night, and then Saturday night, three nights, three days, and he rose again on a Sunday. <clears throat> I have been looking uh, very carefully at the possible dates in our uh, Gregorian calendar and uh, these are the dates that I came up with in terms of um, uh, Jesus crucifixion and birth and um, after researching I found that the most likely date of Jesus uh, I work backwards of course from the crucifixion the most likely date of Jesus birth was about 5 BC our calendar is not actually that accurate and uh, there is no 0 BC or 0 AD, so from 1 BC it jumps straight to 1 AD. Uh, in the Jewish year of 3756, and if he were born on the Feast of Tabernacle, it would have been 16 October, if on that day, 5 BC. Uh, if he were born on the Atonement itself, it would be 11 October. But if he were born on the Passover, which is the most likely, he would have been born on the 21st of April 5 BC. And if you move 4 BC or 6 BC, it would be 11 April or 2nd April. <clears throat> so most likely Jesus' birthday was April 21st uh, on 5 BC. And uh, since there were shepherds in the field at night, it was unlikely to be October, November, December when it's too cold. And <clears throat> so that's just my uh, proposed um, uh, understanding. So I'm not dogmatic about it, and there's nothing to be dogmatic. It's just something good to think about. Now, with that being so, Jesus was born on the 21st of April, 5 BC, on the Passover, since the Passover lamb. Then, um, at what date did Jesus uh, get crucified? And I look at various places when the Passover was. Uh, 2680 Passover was on a Tuesday. 
19 April. On 27 AD, the Passover was on a Sunday, 9 April. And uh, on the 20, uh, 20, 27 AD, the Passover was on a Sunday, 9 April. And on the 28 AD, our time, 26 of April, the Passover was on a Friday. So that's possible. And so the Passover would be the day before after 6 p.m., which will be on the 25th of April, on the 28th AD. The year 28 AD, Jesus had a Passover. He was crucified on the cross on the 26th, uh, on, on the uh, on the uh, on the 26th of April, 28 AD, the day of Passover, and that will be interesting. So since Friday 26, Saturday 27, and on the 28th of Sunday, that would have been the day of Resurrection Easter Sunday. And the year 29 AD is not possible because the Passover was on the 16th of, uh, uh, on the 16th of April on a Thursday. And uh, so most likely, uh, my hypothesis is that the uh, Passover of Jesus was on a Thursday after 6 p.m. on the 25th of April just about four days after his uh, birthday. And so that would be Jesus about uh, 33 years old, and he died on the cross for us, and he was uh, crucified on the 26th of April, 28 AD, on the day of Passover itself. And these are interesting dates that I thought you might be interested in, uh, as you look at Jesus, three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. And I already had done a description and a, a teaching, a preaching on what happened between the cross to the resurrection, how Jesus um, left the body in great triumph full of power and entered into Hades in great power, preached the gospel uh, to all who hear it, and after three days and three nights, he arose from the dead on the Sunday morning and brought the first resurrection, the first fruits. And so I believe it was a literal three days. And whatever happened to Jonah was like a prophetic type. Interesting that some of these prophets became prophetic type and how Jonah came out after uh, three days, three nights, and preach successfully. And he didn't expect the people to repent, but they repented. And uh, so they turned to the Lord. All of them were fasting, including the animals were fasting, wearing sackcloth and ashes. And Jonah was a bit disappointed because these are the people who are the enemies of the Jews, but yet he was sent to them to preach the gospel. So there we have the story of Jonah. And Jesus, exactly three days and three nights, he include the Passover, when he actually entered into the death mode to, to, to die on the cross for us. Those are three days of suffering that Jesus endured for us. And as we look, there is another little example and miracle of the fish. The story of the 5,000 and the 4,000, which Jesus fed them. And looking at the Gospel of Matthew 14, it says, when uh, Jesus uh, looked at them, and every miracle always starts with his compassion. And it says here, uh, verse 13, when Jesus heard it, he departed there by boat to a deserted place by himself. And he wanted to just go away and get some rest for the disciples. But when the, disciples, the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. When Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude. And he was moved with compassion for them. Healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. 
Send the multitudes away that they may go into villages and buy themselves food. The disciples want to send them away. Then Jesus said, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Oh, they got stuck. They says, We only have five loaves and two fishes. And Jesus br says, Bring them here to me. And commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass and he took five loaves and two fish, looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples and of course they gave it to the multitudes. And after everyone had ate together, twelve baskets full, the leftover. Wow, that was quite a multiplication uh, that took place. Because a uh, second miracle came later on and uh, in Matthew uh, 15, the crowd was about 4,000 and this is counting the men, not the women. And again, they have a situation where Jesus has just done healing and great, wonderful healing. And then he again said the same thing, I have compassion. I have compassion on the multitude because they have not they have now continued with me three days and nothing to eat. So, why well, they had nothing to eat. And then I do not want to send them away, lest they faint on the way. Again, the disciples, this is the second time the miracle happened. They still never come to a level of faith. They say, where can we find enough prey in the wilderness to fill such a multitude? And Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? Seven and a few fish. And then Jesus again commanded them to sit. He took the seven loaves and the fish and he gave thanks and broke them and gave them to his disciples. At the end of it, they get seven large leftover baskets. Now, what do the miracle of 5,000 and 4,000 represent? Of course, five is a number of grace, two, a number of fellowship. And then here there are seven, which is seven loaves, which is a number of revelation. You take the two miracles, of course there could have been more, but only two was recorded. It would mean that Jesus was moving them from salvation, which is five, number of grace, and two, men's restoration of fellowship with God, into seven loaves, which represent revelation. So it's like um, the two miracles is like salvation dimension, moving into the Revelation dimension, which took place in the book of Revelation, when he wants us to be a priest, prophets, and kings. And we deal with the Revelation of God. Uh, this will be the first thing we look at the two miracles. And the second thing is the power of blessing and thanksgiving. Jesus did not struggle much in prayer. In fact, to release a miracle, all he did was bless and give thanks. So from these two miracles, we can learn about the power of blessing and thanksgiving. Search your life. If, if, if God were to record your life and put a one statement summary of your life, would God be able to say, this life was filled with blessing and thanksgiving? Or would the epithet to your tombstone be, they always complain and always not happy? <laughs> so what would be a summary of your life? Would people around you, would God, with the angels around you say that, they always are giving thanks. They always are blessing others and receiving the blessings of God. They are never in a negative mode. There is a place in God where we learn to give thanks, learn to worship Him in all situations, and as a result of that, we have an endless flow of blessings and provision and multiplication by God. So let's increase that. 
And I remember a vision, I forgot which preacher it was, and they were preaching about uh, God. And he shared about a person who one day uh, wanted uh, something from God. And then God gave a vision to this person and he saw a scale, a measuring scale. And on one side uh, were needs, on the other side were thanksgiving. And then he saw that thanksgiving was very little and his needs were great. And he knew what to do. So he began to change his life and began to learn to give thanks and praise God and worship God. And after that, he began to see God work in his life. Neither the angels, angels don't like complaining, neither God likes a wicked, negative, curseful mouth. For death and life are in the power of the tongue. And I recommend uh, books by this guy called Merlin Carotus. He only learned one thing and he learned it powerfully. And that is, he learned to praise God in everything. Of course, in his theology, he praised God for everything. So that's the only bone in all his teaching. There are many, many books by him. And he was a soldier, chaplain or something. And then he learned the secret, the one secret that all of us must learn. And so from him, learn these things. He, he, he was sent on earth to only teach this one main truth, which is sometimes not in the heart of many Christians yet. To praise God in everything, in every situation. And as he began to write the book called Prison to Praise, uh, he was arrested for some minor crimes or something. Then he learned how to praise God. At first he was like a normal complaining human being or complaining Christian. He changed his attitude and he began to see miracles. His ministry grew quite large and millions of books. And then there was a book two, book three, book four, which contained the testimonies of many people. He helped many people got answers from God because they learned to praise God in everything and give thanks. The only bone that I see in, the, in that teaching is he did not differentiate between the works of the devil and the works of God. So uh, he be, they began to uh, give thanks for sickness, for disease, for, for terrible things that happen, for tragedies that are caused by the devil. That is my only line of contention and I call it the bone in the teaching. Uh, but learning to praise God in everything is the truth, not praise God for everything because there are things that are caused by the enemy and, <clears throat> and we acknowledge that God didn't send those things. So we need to come to the truth of God and the devil and their works. And then we preserve this lovely, beautiful teaching of praising God in everything. And you will see powerful answers coming your way because you give thanks. Giving thanks does bring about a certain activation of angels and the flow of blessings into our life. So I would recommend the book, <clears throat> recommend the teaching, and just to remove the tiny little bone. But otherwise, praise God in every situation, in everything. And that's in the Bible. That's also in the Bible, as you see, and it's correctly phrased in theological terms. And that is found in First Thessalonians chapter 5. And there's a tiny little verse there, almost like the ending and um, a benediction part. And <clears throat> as he mentioned that, he says in verse 16, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in chapter 5, verse 16, 17, and 18, in everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So you have an actual verse that tells you in everything, good things, bad things, tragedies, sad things, uh, sorrowful things, dangerous things, in everything, give thanks. So these tiny little verse in verse 18 
brings forth that teaching brought forth by Merlin characters who discover the power of praising God. Uh, that was a long time ago in the charismatic move. Uh, but it's still true today. Doctrine is remains true forever. So learn from that and I pray that your attitude in life change. The first thing it will change is your attitude in life, of course. And it did in a time of um, uh, the teaching way went forth in a charismatic move. And so um, that is the teaching you can derive from the five lows. I uh, know five five thousand people, men five thousand men, four thousand men story, in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, <clears throat> then there's this little fish thing that that Jesus um, spoke to Peter, and what does this fish story represent? And somebody asked Jesus in Matthew seventeen. In verse 24, when they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And of course Peter answered, Yes, yes he does. <laughs> and Jesus knew everything. When he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes from their sons or from strangers. Peter said, from strangers. Then Jesus said, then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, take the fish that comes out first, the first fish. He might have many fish, the first one. When you have opened his mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give them for me and you. Pay your tax. <coughs> <coughs> this is an actual situation. <coughs> Peter went. Peter is a fisherman. He knows how to fish by net. I'm sure he knows how to fish by hook. <coughs> so Jesus said, go and use a hook. And the first fish that bites the bait and come up <clears throat> you will find a piece of money take it and pay for your tax and my tax it is powerful you can control the fish so when peter was casting down the hook there could be many fish quite interested in eating the bait <clears throat> but the angel who must be operating also under the sea under the wherever peter fish um make sure that the fish that bite, the first one that bite, is a fish that had just swallowed a coin. So he must have caused the fish that bite the coin to bite the bait. And the first fish that came out, Peter opened it and there was the coin. <coughs> what does that tell us? That everything belonged to God. All the silver and the gold and every uh, cattle and hill and every mountain and every fish in the sea. Jesus does not need a bank because the planet was his bank. Jesus does not need a wallet because the whole planet is his. I mean, if we need more money, he could even reveal, okay, this is a spot where, where uh, some gold dropped into the sea. Jesus knew where everything was. And this tiny little incident tells us that when the time comes and there is a need, God has multiple and infinite resources to bring the money, the gold, the silver into your hands. Who in the world keeps money in a fish? God. <laughs> God knows where everything is. So this tiny little story of Peter fishing one fish, he might fish extra for food, but 
The first was enough. The first was enough to pay his tax and Jesus' tax. <clears throat> At that time, he's really full time serving God. So he really stopped being a fisherman. But Jesus knows where all the money on the planet is hidden. Jesus knows where all the gold and the silver in the planet is hidden. At any place, any time, he can release it into your hands. The only thing is, you notice in every miracle, just do your little part. <clears throat> for Peter, casting the hook down for the first fish. There's only a little part for us to play, but a great part for God and the angels to play. This little story tells us there's no limit to God's supply and no limit to the methods He can use to bless your life. Hallelujah! No limits of methodology, no limits to the avenue in which God can supply us. This little fish story is actually very powerful and it shows the greatness of God's ability to provide for any need that may come into our life. <clears throat> As we cross reference to different other Gospels, in the story of Luke, in uh, Luke chapter 5, and this is before Jesus come and ask them to follow him. And only Luke records the background to that story. It says in chapter, Luke chapter 5 verse 1, so it was as a multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God. And he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them <coughs> and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats and it was Simon's boat. I think he knew and he purposely went to Simon. Asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And don't forget, the night before, they got nothing. No fish. They were professional fishermen. And after Jesus preached and stopped speaking, he rewarded him. After all, he used his boat. Jesus does not use things for free. He always brings blessings. What, whenever you allow yourself to be used by God, whether you're a person who likes to transport people to a church, to a meeting, or a person who likes to help the poor, feed the poor, person who likes to bless God's people, encourage them, and, and do things for them, nothing that you use for God, nothing that you give to God, will not be blessed. In other words, you will be blessed. The boat of Peter was used and now is the time for blessing. Jesus said, use his boat. If Jesus used your house uh, because you're hospitable, you will be rewarded. There is a blessing behind everything that we use for God, that we give or dedicate to God. <clears throat> you can never I'll give God. The blessings will come rolling. So <clears throat> he told Peter, <clears throat> after he stopped speaking, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for catch. So he's telling Peter, go out further, put your net down. And then Peter told him the truth. Master, we had toiled all night, we never slept all night. We caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. The moment they let it down, a great number of fish came and the net was breaking the signal to their partners to help. And they came and filled two boats. There was so much fish that the boat was almost going to sink. Think about the ability of God to bless you. And when you give your life to serve God, like I have serving God full time, I do know that God will provide. When you use anything for God, 
your house, your home, your car, God will bless you. You cannot outgive God. Remember, the night before they had nothing. So again, the angels and God and the angels must be. I'm just uh, visualizing. It might not actually happen. They will have to be in a place. Maybe the unwater and the and the the shoals of fish swimming, and they would command the fish to go into the net. So much that probably in their whole lifetime, as fishermen, they never seen such a thing. And you and I know that. Daytime is not the time to fish. Usually it's in the night, or in the early morning, or in late at night. Uh, and that's a good time to fish. Uh, very few people go in the, in the hot afternoon or hot morning and just try fishing. <coughs> but the angels were in charge. So we are angels in charge of fish, commanding the fish to go in, to be caught, to sacrifice themselves for the miracle of God. And when God gives, He gives abundantly. God is not a miser. When He gives, He gives abundantly. So expect the abundance of God when you have done everything you know to serve God, to give to God, or to surrender to God. And the moment they saw the abundance of fish such that the boat began to sink, it really went lower down the water because of the weight. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. He know himself. Uh, he and all the others were astonished at the catch which they had taken. Probably in their whole lifetime, never happened before. When Jesus does something and bless you, it is like never been done before. I'm looking forward to that. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought uh, <clears throat> their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. <clears throat> so there was a... a, a a miracle that took place before they followed him, not mentioned in the other Gospels. Jesus is capable of showing you his ability before you even make a choice. Now one thing you can also learn from the miracle of 5,000 with five loaves, two fishes, and, uh, and 4,000 with seven loaves and few fish, that when Jesus has done a miracle, he can do it again and again and again. So every miracle that you see in the Bible, if you have faith, it can happen again even in our modern times. I believe that. And once God has done it before, He's capable of repeating a miracle. We should have faith for that. And when God does blessing, he blessed abundantly. God is not a miser. When He blessed, He blessed abundantly. When He pours, He pours in great abundance. But when He made you wait, you really have to wait. Look at Job. God was blessing him because he was a faithful person, a righteous guy. But when he lost everything, he was at zero. God doubled all his blessings. Remember, he has to start from zero. God has to bless him to where he had before, and then times two. So at the end of Job, in Job 42, everything was double. When God bless, he doubles, he triples, he gives abundantly. We must have faith. That God can bring back everything you lost times two, times three. For God is an abundant God. That's what we learn from these lovely parables and teachings on fish. And that was what gave them faith that, okay, 
he is able to create a harvest or a net full of fish from nothing. We had tried the whole night. We can trust this man for food, clothing and shelter. And indeed, they never lack all their lives. That's a powerful thing. And <clears throat> when you give your life to serve God, I expect Him to provide. From the first day that I served God and went for Baptist Seminary, and I believe He will provide. And something He used interesting ways to provide. And of my first provision that God provided with a seminary student was a tiny little money order that came from my father who just chased me out of the house and, and wanted to, to, to disown me because I served God. I remember at first it was $70, then later it grew to about $100, $100 something. And it was just enough for me to pay for my meals in a Baptist seminary. I had nothing left. And sometimes it got a bit more, uh, enough for a bus fare to the church. And, and so I've seen God do miraculous things. And God don't always use rich people. In fact, sometimes rich people are very stingy and too calculative for God to use them. And when I left the seminary and started an uh, independent ministry called Alleluia Christian Missions, and I was still in a little rented house, and I started a little Bible study and prayer. And so God used interesting means of provision, and I saw that one of those who uh, sometimes supported me was a uh, kindergarten teacher and uh, one day I found that near the window it was a lower window so you know the, the, like that can close and open and I usually leave it open for the air to come through uh, I found a hey, money on the floor next to the window and I became curious and I said hey, how did the money come and one day I saw that it was this kindergarten teacher who teach in the church nearby and once in a while she come and she dropped her tithes offerings through the window <laughs> so I suddenly found money on the floor and it was enough to support me and pay for the rent. And then uh, we continued to believe God what we got. And then at that time I didn't have much and I had never seen a thousand dollars before in my life. And one fine day, there was among the people who came for the Bible study, there was one of those who uh, I reckon had to be like... Uh, like a widower, and she doesn't have much. And one fine day, she gave this envelope and said, this is what the Lord told me to give. And I said, okay, praise the Lord, thank you. And I took it. At the end of the meeting, I opened it. Wow, I counted $1,000. I count and recount and recount. Because at that time, I only like 50 stands or uh, nearly 100. Never seen $1,000 in my whole life. And then, I was blessing the Lord, praising the Lord. And then as I was counting it and rejoicing, I heard the voice of God say, I want you to give it all away. Your first fruits. And so I obeyed God. And I remember I gave all the thousand dollars. And you're not supposed to do that. But that time, you know, I was still in my early 20s, probably about 2021, 20, and, and I was still learning a lot of things of the world. Remember, I went straight from studies, uh, after studies, straight to Bible school. And um, so I just put everything in the envelope and sent the whole thing to memory, Cerulo, post. And they receive it, they acknowledge it. Thank God for that. I should not, I should say, convert it in some other form to send. And um, then from that day, I saw God begin to bless me. And that's how I understand the principle that if you give by the tens, the same measure you use is measured to you. You start receiving by the tens. You start giving a hundred, you start be receiving by the hundred. And if that's all your capacity, that's all going to be. So you must break through. So when you start giving in the thousands, it comes back in the thousands. I began to see God uh, know, uh, stir people out like the Philippines and begin to uh, help the ministry. I was able to regularly publish a magazine called Alleluia Magazine and um, uh, for some time. And so that costs uh, thousands when you print. And I give it out free. So 
it's, I saw the ministry expand through the years. So indeed, God is a faithful God. And He bless when He bless, He bless abundantly. So if you want to see a uh, blessing come by the thousands, you need to give by the thousands. And of course, most of us have never seen blessing come by the millions because very few people are at the capacity. But they could be in the hundreds of thousands and then they will see God's blessing. So do not jump. Even in giving, you must let your faith grow. And don't, don't believe some preachers who try to manipulate you to make you take loans to give. You never do that. You bless out your abundance and never overstretch your faith. And so well, the day will come when many of you will be able to give by the millions and you will be blessed by the millions. <coughs> so we will grow. <coughs> we will grow and grow in our capacity to give and in our capacity to receive. It's a law of God. We whatever measure you bless is a measure that God will measure back to you. <coughs> and um, so this is the little teaching we can have from this story of the miracle of the catch that Peter had. Uh, lovely stories on fish and I, I love these little fish parables and stories. And uh, <clears throat> then we come to, we have to come to Matthew 13, the dragnet. <clears throat> and Matthew 13 is especially for end time. It's like a prophecy. In Matthew 13, there is a little parable of fish called the parable of the dragnet. And we touch on it when we talk about gnashing and uh, uh, gnashing and uh, wailing, gnashing of teeth. So in this parable of the dragnet is Matthew 13 verse 47. <clears throat> says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea <clears throat> and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, and threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and he asked them, have you understood all these things? <laughs> they say yes. And what is this parable about? This parable uh, talking about the end times. At the end times, there will be a great super time of evangelism and signs and wonders where all kind of people will come and be attracted to the signs and wonders and the miracles. But not all of them will have a pure heart. They will have different motivations, different reasons for coming. And so there will be a great anti-harvest led by the angels where all the gospel will be preached. And this is an end time saying of Jesus to Matthew 24, that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached and all kinds of fish and all kinds of men will be drawn into it. And after that, there will be a separation between those who are truly pure and born again and who love God and those who are, are not right in their hearts and they will be rejected. So not everyone who says a sinner's prayer, not everyone who seems to be coming to attend the church or be a part of Christianity is born again. There will be this little uh, parable tell us uh, a prophecy. Number one, there will be a great harvest coming. Number two, there will be a great separation taking place. And then the end will take place. That is from the parable of the dragnet. Another little parable about fish. Hallelujah. And then <clears throat> there is this little finale thing after the resurrection of Jesus. And after the resurrection of Jesus, uh, <clears throat> Jesus appeared and the disciples were in a room. Bible story here is from the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. 
and Jesus appeared to them in verse 36 of Luke 24. Uh, as they said these things, as they're talking about all the people who had witnessed Jesus' resurrection, uh, they were discussing, and suddenly Jesus appeared to them while they were discussing. And Jesus appeared, didn't come through the door, just appeared and said, Peace to you. And they were terrified, they were frightened, and they said, Oh, this, have we seen a ghost? Is it a spirit? And he said, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, it is I myself. Handle me, see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this thing, he showed them his hands, his feet. And his hands still got the pierce, pierce mark, the same with his feet. His sight that he might not have shown, there was a pierce, uh, pierce sight. And I asked the question, you know how Jesus can heal? He can recreate a new body. Why didn't he remove his pierced hands and pierced feet inside? After all, he had a new resurrection body. He could remove all the, all the wounds. They were kept for eternity so we remember what he did for us. And this time though, it's not blood that flow. There's a type of light that shines through through Jesus' pierced hands. And it was kept as a sign forever of what Jesus has done for us. A permanent sign. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. We can never forget what he did. You ever forget, look at his hands. He did that for you and I. Now, after they seen his hands and feet, they were so happy. And then Jesus asked them the next question. Have you any food here? And they gave him a piece of raw fish and some honeycomb. He took it and ate it in their presence. And afterward, he just disappeared. And uh, he led them out and they all went to, uh, as far as Bethany, uh, where the ascension took place. Why did Jesus eat fish? Now we know Jesus is not a vegetarian. Because he ate Passover lamb and he ate fish. So Jesus was not a vegetarian. Why did he eat this broiled fish? To show them that the resurrected body is, surpasses the natural body. The resurrected body can eat natural things, assimilate it easily as he can eat spiritual things. And it was to show them that his resurrection was physical. It was not like an image or just a spirit. This is, a spirit cannot eat natural things. He wanted to show them that this resurrected body was a physical resurrection. And the body physically can touch and eat natural things. It was to show them that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is spirit, so, and physical body. That was a reason for eating this fish. So, a little story. And the last one is found in John. In John chapter 21. This is again after his resurrection and Peter and the disciples had gone fishing nearby. And Peter said, I'm going fishing. And the said, yeah, I'm going with you. And they should have gone to Galilee kind of thing, but they still didn't obey. And while they were fishing in verse, uh, chapter 21, verse 3, they caught nothing. So just as angels can, can make you have abundance of fish, 
angels and also stop you receiving any fish. I believe there was something supernaturally caused. So it's another of those nights when they did their best and caught nothing. Because they were not supposed to be fishing. Jesus told them that they should go to Galilee, he will meet with them. <coughs> and instead they went fishing. So I believe in this, where they fish and they got nothing, it was caused by the angels. When it's not time for you to receive a blessing of God or an anointing, you should wait. Wait until the fullness of time when God determines it is time. <coughs> <clears throat> when something is not for you, no matter how hard you try, you will never have it. So you never need to worry about properties, about things, and about money, about finances, about position, about power. Because if it's not yours, it is not yours. But when it's taken away and it's supposed to be yours, no one can take away from you what God wants you to have. So you should not have fear. At the same time, of course, when you balance this through, I don't mean by being overcautious or, or over lazy. You know, some things you have to be fast to discern it and go for it, otherwise you miss the opportunity. However, you should not have fear because everything that is yours will be yours. Determined by God in heaven. And what is not yours will never be yours. I believe it was the angels who stopped them from re receiving a single fish because Jesus had a lesson for them in mind. So having got nothing in verse uh, 21, chapter 21, verse 3, they went out and immediately go into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples, because of the distance, did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? This is the second question Jesus asked them whether they got food. <laughs> yeah, it sounds very Chinese, isn't it? In the Chinese, uh, they don't necessarily meet and greet each other and says, how are you? They always say, my father always says, have you eaten? <laughs> have you eaten? Uh, uh, let's chat, boy. I say, you know, have you eaten? <laughs> and uh, so, uh, he says, have you got any food? <laughs> and Jesus said, cast the net on the right side of the boat, you will find some. It's not just some, they had a multitude and abundance. The moment they put it down, and these are angels working again, they must have caused all the fish to get into the net, to sacrifice themselves for Jesus, for the miracle. <coughs> there was so much fish and so heavy that uh, uh, they need a lot of help to pull it to the land. And the moment John saw the miracle, John was the first one and said to Peter, It is the Lord! Exclamation mark. Now Peter, when he heard that it was the Lord, and pulled his outer garment and plunged into the sea and swam to Jesus. And the other disciple came in a little boat and they were not far from land. They were dragging the net with fish. And when they came to the shore, they saw the coal of fires there. And Jesus asked them, come and eat breakfast. And no one dared to talk to him and say, who are you? <laughs> You're Jesus. Although the resurrection form seemed to be a little bit different from physical, still recognizable, but still sometimes hard to recognize. The total number of fish, they were full of large fish. 153. Now, this parable, in 2014, we went to Israel. 
and we visited several places, Jerusalem, and the Sea of Galilee, Mount Carmel. And when we were in the Sea of Galilee, <coughs> I think we did take a boat there, I think we did. <coughs> and when we were there, I suddenly got a revelation for the 153. And it was an angel uh, spoke to me, the Lord spoke to me and said, the 153 is four periods of seven times seven plus six years. They are like uh, what I call uh, uh, injury time or spare time. So it was uh, one for our, uh, is uh, 49 times three plus six. <coughs> I understood it. And the Lord told me that. Uh, even from the time of 1906 and uh, 1850, uh, 18, uh, what, what was it, 1859, there was a countdown of 7x7, 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 7 to 2012 when we begin the last countdown of 7x7. There were six years that were in the Second World War that were uh, discounted because the Second World War was important because it brought forth the Ten Toes. And then when I checked those dates, I realized that you have certain dates like 1908 and 1859. And I checked what happened in 1859 was one of the biggest solar flares uh, that we experienced so that a lot of things got disrupted. So there was a movement of the sun. So it was an important time something must have taken place. And um, I do not know where God's people are since most of them are not recorded. I'm sure there is a man of God or woman of God in that generation that God must have revealed something. And they must have released something at that time. And then the next point was 1906 to 1908, which was the Azusa Street Revival, which practically changed Christianity on the planet Earth in a modern 20th and 21st century. So uh, from 1908, uh, uh, there is a 1908. There is a countdown of the 49 years of 77. It was only when I was in Galilee that the Lord say, "Your end time 2012 was important, and the countdown has begun. It's related to the countdown that God has in 1906, 1908." when God started bringing the end time things forward. So thank God for his revelation. So I got that revelation when I was in Galilee, in Israel, what the 143 men. On top of that, these were not small fish. I mean the angels told all the small fish, don't come. And only the huge ones came. And uh, you notice that it as it is mentioned, that these are huge fish, they are not small fish. And uh, the large fish, as the words are used for them, is the word mega. Which we really mean big. These are mega fish. 153 of them exactly. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. So what do these fish represent? They represent uh, major players in this end time revival. And we know there are major players in 1906 to 1908 in the Azusa Street revival. And in, in this end time revival, there are many major players uh, whom God anoint and use. And many of you are part of this uh, army of God under David, the mighty man of valor, the 30 mighty men. In fact, the angels didn't start revealing their name at first. They give us pseudonyms, or pseudo might not be the right word, synonyms. Yeah, pseudo is false, so synonym is the correct word. Synonyms. And when the people who were involved at that time that they were, were given the names of the angel, the name of the angel was, was given as a, as a name of one of the 30 men of David, 30 mighty men. And I was give uh, my my angel name, whom I now know as Agurela. Uh, he was given the name of the leader of all the thirty, and then there are several important ones that given different things. So, this end time move is an army of God, 
And recently I realized uh, that the church is supposed to be like an army of God because all the 10,000 angels that are in charge of the 10,000 churches, they are under Michael, the archangel. You know, there's Michael, Gabriel, and there's Raphael, uh, Raguel, Uriel, and uh, uh, all these, uh, Pakfanuel, they're all different, different positions in the seven heavens. And uh, uh, I was thinking recently, over the past week, two weeks, uh, why are they under Michael? I mean, they go under Gabriel, after all gospel. And each angel appear for certain reason because they have a uh, assignment to different revelation. And Michael is known to be a warring angel. And then I say, wow, these 10,000 angels of the future 10,000 churches we are planting are warring angels. They imply that the church is the army of God. And all of you are part of the army of God, the first 70, first 7,000, first 700,000. You're going to be a mighty group of people as part of the army of God. And may the blessing of God come upon each one of you. You're not tiny little fish. You're all big fish in the Lord. Mega fish. That God will put a special anointing in your life and use you mightily in this end time. Let's pray. Father, we know the power of blessing. The power of blessing upon uh, Ephraim and Manasseh changed them from the other tribes. So I pray the power of blessing over each one of these who are present on this Sunday service today. Let this blessing, this anointing, and this prosperity, and this breakthrough be powerful upon each life. May they receive it with great joy. And thank you, Father, for all your teachings in the parable of fish. We thank you, Father, there's so much for us to learn of Jesus. And let all that you have in store for us come into our hands and account. For we know that prosperity is given even before we were born. Just as Joseph was born to be a ruler, Daniel was born to be the head and advisor of empires. So we know, Father, in your predestination in our life, it involves the power that we will handle, the authority we will handle, the wealth we will handle. So we thank you for your predestination in our life. Let it be unto us according to your word, according to your plan, according to your predestination. Let your will be done, your kingdom be established. We praise you, we thank you, we give you all glory, praise and worship. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. I will I pass the time to Colleen where we have questions and answers. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. So for questions and answers, you can post your question in the chat now or you can unmute yourself to ask. So please go ahead. <clears throat> so let me ask you a question. How many of you have read Merlin Carotas, Prison to Praise and his other praise and worship book? There are three, four, five books he wrote. If you haven't, it's a very easy book to read. Uh, you could read it in an hour or two. Uh, and it's inspirational how he came to understand how to praise God in everything. For him it was four, but four is not the correct theology. In is the correct one. <clears throat> and Colin, have you read Merlin Carotas? No, I don't think so. Ah, very powerful truth. Only one truth. Just like Hagin came to teach faith, Merlin Carotas was raised by, by God to teach praise and thanksgiving. Uh, quite a powerful testimony he had. Yeah. <clears throat> a good book to read. I don't know whether it's available online or in PDF. If anyone has, please share it. Such a simple truth changed his life. And he built his entire ministry 
and teaching people to praise God in everything. Okay, here, Jalan says, I read him the crucifixion. Why can it not be in 29 uh, Thursday? Uh, because if it's on Thursday, the Passover is on Wednesday. So then Jesus will die on a Thursday, not on Friday, which should mean there is a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, it's possible, but uh, because I included the Passover as his death, so he included that there will be four days plus the Passover when he drank the cup of death to himself. Like I said, it's a hypothesis, so I'm not dogmatic about it. Can possibly be on the 29th. And we should make it on the 29th. We should make Jesus uh, for be born on the 5th, unless he changed it to 4th. 5th of 5 BC, about possibly 34 years, which is still a possibility. So I'm not dogmatic. Possible. <laughs> uh, oh, there's a, a Mina has given the place to download. Hey, is that download possible? Praise books. Huh. Don't tell me his ministry is still there. He has a number book, yes. The first is the most important. Then the second is teaching more and, and many testimonies of people who will break truths. When you read the testimony of breakthroughs by the hundreds of thousands, you'll be amazed that such a simple truth can be so powerful. And I guess uh, if you absorb this teaching, you will never be a complaining Christian again. And uh, you will truly be uh, a worshipful Christian in every circumstance. And you think about it, if our praise and worship is limited by our circumstances, that means when it's good, then you praise God, thank God. When it's not good, it doesn't, don't do that. It is a very shallow Christianity. So we need to be bigger than that. So that's why I recommend this simple book. And at least have a read through it and absorb what he's trying to bring, minus that tiny little bone. And, um, so it's a, it's a good principle to adopt into your life. Make this one of your, Life principle. I will praise God in everything. After it's in First Thessalonians 5, verse 18. And it will change your life. Change your attitude. Change your lips. Change your heart. You will change your circumstances. Praise the Lord. Any other questions? Well, praise God. Um, call in any other things that will contribute uh, to that. Any particular prophecy for Iran in the end times? Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Iran and Iraq are under the domain of the Assyrian Empire. So prophecies that refer to Assyria now refer uh, to Iran and Iraq. And so there are some about how the Antichrist is going to be leading and dominating the area of Iran and Iraq. And you know the old name for Iran was Persia. And uh, apparently Daniel was uh, buried somewhere in Persia, my Middle Persian Empire, where he died. 
And so Daniel had a great role last time in the empire. And there are many, many prophecies about Syria. A lot of them uh, point to Iran and Iraq. So, praise the Lord. Uh, uh, Colin, any uh, last words? Yeah, Pastor, the other time you were telling us that there was somebody that uh, uh, went to heaven and saw, uh, uh, I think what, saw Jesus eat fish? Ah, yes, yes. The Madam Kwon, a Chi uh, Korean uh, lady who wrote the book about heaven. So they interpreted that uh, it's good to eat fish. But actually, it is good to eat fish, you know, because uh, yeah. yesterday I was uh, just looking at a uh, uh, kind of like documentary video from a lot of health experts, and they said that if uh, we eat uh, uh, good quality fish oil every day, it actually makes, uh, I mean, they show that um, there was a significant difference to the health of uh, people doing mm. it. Yeah. Omega oil also, eh? Yeah, Omega oil. <laughs> just the, the Omega fish oil, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was some madam something who wrote in heaven. And then when I examined her vision, because she said in heaven people eat fish. I've been to heaven. Nobody eat meat. And the fish can talk so you don't eat them. <clears throat> and they're conscious. And um, so uh, then when I checked her vision, she had a vision in a certain place by the sea, and that's where she got all her downloads in her vision. And it was in that vision that she saw eating of fish. So I believe that even in her vision in heaven, it was a parable vision. It was not a real heaven of people eating fish. Imagine, uh, uh, what I call it? the Lord's Supper of the Lamb. Whoa, you got lamb for lamb. You got fish. You got no, no. Everything is fruit, but the fruit are more delicious than meat. And so, no, nobody ate fish in heaven. So, it's a misinterpretation of a true uh, parable vision. And then she began to recommend everybody eat fish. So I say. This is what happens when young Christians have visions and try to do teaching and interpretation. And so it becomes a bit false. Imagine if, if a, a, a non-Christian hear that, what do they think about us Christians? You know, we are very crazy people. Ah, yeah, Chu Thomas is the one. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so I respect that she has real visions, but I challenge the interpretation. <clears throat> yeah, perhaps uh, after that she applied to um, having people uh, asking people to eat fish is uh, uh, the right application in a way uh, that the Lord may actually uh, give to her that is it's actually uh, something for the earth not for heaven yes yeah, definitely yeah uh, Mina asks also huge revival prophets in the Bible for Assyria uh uh, Syria, which involves Syria, Iran, and Iraq. Yes, there are three countries involved in Assyria. And all over the Middle East, along with Israel. 19, Zion 19. This has already begun, especially since 2020. Yes, correct. There is a prophecy in Zion 19, which talks about a highway that goes between Egypt, Israel, and Assyria. And Assyria involves Syria, Iran, and Iraq. And so some sort of revival is bound to come to pass. You know that Egypt right now is building another new capital in Sinai. So a lot of money is going to that. And so some interesting prophecies will be fulfilled at the end time between Assyria, Israel and Egypt. They all have their special times in God's prophecy. Well, if we have no more questions, I'm going to declare the benediction. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace, love, glory, power, life, wisdom, and mercies. All the seven spirits of God. The Lord live up his countenance upon you and cause his face to shine so powerfully, mightily upon you that though you might still have elements of persecution and tribulations, you will find joy in your heart and you will find breakthroughs in your physical life, in prosperity, in promotions and in opportunities and open doors given to you. May the wealth of this end time ministry be yours to share, be yours to partake, be yours in your life. Thank you, Father God, for all your grace and mercies upon our life. We thank you that everything is fulfilled in our life according to your word. And nothing in heaven, earth, or hell can stop all that are supposed to come into our hands. Let it all come into our hands as it is time, as set by the decree of the ancient of days, that it's time for the saints to possess your kingdom. So let your kingdom's wealth and power and grace in signs and wonders be demonstrated. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, that someone provided. Uh, oh yeah, that's a uh, thank you for the link. Uh, you're talking about the prophecies. Amen. God bless each one of you. We are definitely fulfilling prophecies, and the blessings of God are assigned to you. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you. God bless you, Pastor. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.